Welcome everyone to the first episode of Unbuckled Chinstrap. I'm your host, Paul Rabel. Now the premise of this show is simple. We unbuckle the unique lives and untold stories of the best lacrosse players in the world. Now before I get into this first episode, I wanna make a quick call out. This is the first episode of our PLL Podcast Network, a network that we announced and will house two shows in the first month of launch. That's right now and upwards to a half a dozen in 2020. Each of these are unique value add to you, the listener. Now, I would personally appreciate if you subscribe to not only Unbuckled Chinstrap, but our other show that's about to launch, The Inside Feed. More on that after my interview. Now, I'm excited to share this inaugural episode featuring Redwoods Attackman, PLL, and TikTok star, Ryder Garnsey. Him and I sit down and discuss his time at Notre Dame, the ups and downs, especially when he was declared academically ineligible right before his senior season started, then decided to play in the playoffs against my alma mater, Johns Hopkins. Among a wide range of other topics, Ryder gave us insight into his in-game mindset, what it's like playing for Nat St. Laurent in the Redwoods, his training, nutrition, sometimes lack thereof, his eye black style and overtime celebrations. All right, let us begin with Ryder Guns. Welcome to the offices, brother. Thanks for having me. How long have you been in LA now? Two uh, days? Got here Friday, um, leave tomorrow, up to San Francisco for New Year's. Nice. What were you doing here? Just visiting some fam. My mom grew up out here. Uh, my brother and sister live out here now. Uh, I've got nice. five nieces and nephews, so I try to get out here as much as I can to visit them. I tried to uh, convince you over a breakfast. I forget what game weekend that was to move out here, but you're not anymore because you just took the undergrad coaching job at Notre Dame? Yeah, so... You're not, killing us, man. Not in the next five months. Um, we'll see what happens. Oh, does Corgan know that? You're only doing it for five months? <laughs> well... <laughs> Hope you know the plan is to graduate um, at the at the end of the semester, and then that role you know doesn't exist anymore. There um, you go. In college across, you only got you know three coaches and a volunteer, so those spots were filled at Notre Dame. Um, originally, I was planning on just doing um, finishing earlier, obviously, because you know everyone plans on finishing in four years. Right. But I got a couple <laughs> of credits left, um, and I was enrolled in the fall went to class for the first two weeks and then I learned that you can only be part-time once so I had to drop out of school reapply for the spring semester um, and then I'll be finishing up in the spring like one class a day basically um, yeah how many credits five five and, and what's your major film theater and television there you um, go so you, you have a role back here in LA with yeah the PLL man that's what we do <laughs> we're not even a sports league we're, we're a we're a media company. Yeah, so um, all my requirements are done. So just electives, uh, yeah. elective credits. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see. And then go to practice every day and train with the team and stay yeah. in shape. We were going to come back here later, at least in my mapping of notes, but let's stay here now. So you were, you were at Notre Dame for four years. Mm -hmm. You led the team in scoring, all this kind of awesome stuff that we know you for and why you had a great uh, rookie year in the PLL. And then you were academically ineligible your senior year. Yep. When did that happen? At that, like, what moment did you realize that was that after the the winter, or is that in a in a trimester stage? Like, kind of remind us or talk us through what happened, and then the decision that you made, which you couldn't play that spring. But then when you guys made the playoffs, there's this like gray area that the NCAA allows, considering a new season, for right. you to make your decision. You decided to play instead of you know, sitting out that entire year, which you would have been playing this season. So just right. tell us everything that happened. Yeah, so um, we, we're semesters at Notre Dame. So basically this time last year, um, I, you know, found out officially that I wasn't going to be eligible for the for the spring. And I, what's the eligibility? Uh, 2.0. 2 so I, I didn't. I didn't go to enough class, basically. I basically called my professor's bluff. That was like, you need to come to X amount of classes um, in order to uh, pass a class. And I was just like, I've seen so many classes like that before that that just is like not true. And it's coming to class, not it's, like doing well. It's like you needed to attend this yeah, class. It's like if you miss, you know, five classes, you can't pass a class. Oh, you're completely out. And I was just like, yeah, right. Did they do grades? Uh, or is it pass so fail? I, so I failed that class. Yeah, I failed the class, and I thought I was going to get like a B plus or something. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, because some Ivies and a lot of grad schools just do pass fail, but this is grade, and he was like, you can't even get a grade that it allows you to pass the class if you don't right. hit the it's minimum just, requirement if you don't, attendance. Yeah, re minimum requirement for attendance, and then you just fail. So I was banking on 
because you know I was never a 4.0 student and I had flirted with eligibility my first semester in college um and that was I didn't fail any classes but I was just getting bad grades because yeah. I whatever I wasn't studying hard enough um so I was just I was I like did the math with all my what I thought I was going to get with all the grades and I thought I was going to pass and then I failed that class and right then I, I remember being um, I was driving home from Boston. I was playing some box lacrosse over break. Um, and I was driving home and I was talking to my academic advisor and he was just like, yeah, this is a deal. Like it, it, you're basically, you're not going to be eligible. And yeah. I, I just remember like crying on my way home. Just like, how the hell am I going to explain this to my mom and dad? Like, right. I'm such a jackass. Yeah. Um, did they talk to you? Your academic advisor talked to you before they spoke to Corgan? Um, or, did, or did Coach Corgan know? And he, he did was, you have to break was, the news to him? He was in the loop. I didn't have to break the news to yeah. him, but we, you know, we have a pretty good relationship now. It wasn't always the greatest, but um, well, so you guys he, are coaching together now, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll be spending a lot of time with him now. Um, so he was in the loop. He knew what was going on. Um, yeah. So that was a pretty, a pretty. Can I swear? Yeah, of course. Pretty shitty uh, Christmas break last. And then you caught year. a bunch of shit after they announced it. They announced it on Inside Lacrosse, if I recall. Yeah, I, f- I forget I remember how seeing it got. Something, and then Twitter just started going insane. Yeah, I I remember I, w- so I had like told my close friends basically like, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna be able to play this year, and they were like, you're an asshole and an idiot, and I was like, you're right. Um, and then I remember waking up and I went back to school early. Um, just to see if there was anything I could do at the, you know, at that point, like, hey, is there any like extra assignment I can do to maybe, you know, bump this grade up or whatever? And there wasn't. Um, so I was in South Bend. I remember I woke up in my bed and I just looked at my phone and I had so many notifications, like text messages from people that I don't talk to frequently and Twitter notifications and all this stuff. And I was just like, oh shit. I, yeah. It definitely got out. Yeah. And so, yeah, it did. And then. So you broke it to your parents, broke it to the team. You were going to practices and stuff, or does academic ineligibility mean you can't even get, you can't even be there? No. So my schedule is exactly the same. It didn't change anything except for away games and obviously home games. I wasn't playing, but I would be on the sideline. Um, actually, coach gave me um, some like things to track as the game was going on that I could give him at halftime that would hopefully make, you know, his adjustments a little bit easier to see where we were struggling in different areas. Um, so he kept me involved in that way. And then during the week I was practicing just like I would, uh, you know, if I were to be playing on the weekends, except for I was on the scout team. So the way that we do things at Notre Dame for the most part, like, um, Mondays and Tuesdays are, you know, depending on what, when we play that week or, a little bit of rest and recovery and uh, maintenance, maybe some stick work skills. Um, and then later in the week is more like implementing the, the game plan and um, the scout team, you know, has their roles as the people that are on the other team. So I was going up against our best players, you know, a couple times a week uh, as somebody else trying to get them ready for the games on the weekend. So, yeah. um, you know, honestly, that made practice a little bit more fun sometimes just because the monotony of the season was broken up a little bit every week I had a new challenge um but yeah that it was it was but at the same time it was hard because yeah I wanted to be working on my own game on Thursday rather than being you know this attackman from Virginia or whoever playing that week and I had to be that guy for the week if it was a crease attackman that they wanted me to play that's what I was doing yeah, and so the way it works is you were ineligible because of your grades from the preceding semester. Right. So the grades that you were working on that spring, you you got a line of sight as to like at what point, all right, I'm going to be above a 2-0. That means if we make the playoffs, I'll have a decision to make where I can potentially play and be accretive to the team. When did you and Coach Corgan start talking about that behind the scenes? Because it felt like a surprise to everyone else, and then everyone r- rushed to the rule book and be like, how is this possible? Ah, got it. Yeah, so I had been, you know, right when right when I got back to campus in January or whatever, I met with Coach, and he was like, what do you, what do you want to do? What are, and I was like, well, I'm not a thousand percent sure with what my options are because, you know, this isn't something that I was planning on, you know, trying to navigate. Um, but my freshman year, there was an older guy on the team that did the same thing that I did this past year. So I had an idea of what was possible. Um, 
And then there was the another possibility of like this waiver process where maybe I would get the year back and be able to play, then do a fifth year and play. Um, but that was very much up in the air. There's no guarantees. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, leading up to um, the first playoff game, it was just like, I'm not going to take the chance of maybe playing. And maybe not. And maybe not. And it was it, Hopkins. And it was Hopkins you know? in the playoffs. And you know, everyone if, wants to beat Hopkins. If you're a competitor like <laughs> like we are, h- how was I going to wake up the morning of the Hopkins game and tell like the guys that I came to school with and spent four years with, like, hey guys, I'm going to sit this one out. Like, was was there any difficulty in navigating? You know, obviously you're coming in. You're going to be now the the lead guy. You're going to be a role. Uh, the leader on the field and also fill in the role of a first attackman. So you've got guys that have been pounding the pavement all season long. How are you ha- having those conversations with them? Like, okay, I'm back now for the playoffs and you're now going to play less. Yeah. I mean, that was definitely hard. That was for, the hardest. I mean, it was hard to navigate that because obviously I want to play. I want to play every second of every game, just like everybody does, you know? Um, But at the same time, I realized that I had nothing to do with getting us to the playoffs. These guys worked their ass off every week and played and scored the goals that actually mattered. I mean, I scored goals in practice, but those don't get counted or whatever. So these guys did all the hard work. How am I going to come in and like just take these guys minutes? So so that was hard. Um, And that was something I talked about with coach. Um, And I remember he came up to me after the uh, Hopkins game and he was just like, make sure you let those guys know how important they were to, you know, cause you're getting, you know, all this attention now that you're back and playing and stuff, but we don't get here without them. Right. And, and I was just like, you're a thousand percent right. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure these guys know how important they are and how appreciative I am of them to have gotten us to this point. Um, and I don't, and I can't thank my teammates enough because I never felt any pushback. I never felt anyone being like, you know, screw this guy. He didn't do anything for us for the last five months. Why is he getting this playing time? Everyone, to me, everyone was just happy to have me back. Yeah, and you had awesome. proven your worth and led the team for three full years, three and a half years, and then they probably respected the fact that you were doing all that scout team work too. Yeah, yeah, I so, think so. I think that that was, you know, my mindset every day was at some point I'm going to be back on the field. So these guys can't feel like I'm checked out for these three months and then the week before I'm supposed to play again, I'm like, all right, let's go, you know, the rah, rah guy. So I just, I try to make sure that my level of um, commitment and intensity was the same as if I was going to be playing um, on the weekends. Yep. So then you got, you guys pumped Hopkins, lost to Duke in overtime. And then all of a sudden your life shifts again and you're, you're done your athletic eligibility in school our draft had taken place. Everyone, kind of at least on, on this side of the house, was uncertain. I remember you being on a draft board, but uncertain on the decision you were going to make around playoffs. And just as you said, he could come back another year. That's, that's my guess as to why you weren't taken. So you're undrafted. And then I remember getting a text message from Paul Carcaterra being like, yo, you guys got to figure out how to get Garnsey. And I was like, well, I, I got it. Like we're, we're, we are, we're hoping to, and it's up to the coaches, but I hear you. But I, I don't get a text message from Paul saying that about other people. And he was like, yo, this guy is the truth. He was like, exactly what you need for this league, skill, hands, goal scorer, talk shit. We'll get the crowd fired up. It's got style and flair. And like, he's like, like, I know what you guys are building, you know, and, and this is it. And we also, we were like, you know, pick up the phone and calling the coaches. You guys are making a move here. And and of course, like Nat made the move uh, on the waiver wire. So there's a little bit of chance ahead of that. But um, I'd imagine you were trying to figure out what to do for yourself, given the talent density we had in the PLL. And then I'm sure MLL was calling you. So what were that? What were those two weeks like? Yeah, that was honestly some of the most like stressful time of my life. It was. <laughs> because like I had no control over it. I mean, I have a ton of confidence in myself if you can't you know, tell that from the way that I play and the way that I carry myself on the field. But I didn't know, you know, like what type of opportunity I was going to be given. Cause like you said, these teams are so good. Like, so you were thinking about, Hey, I just want to be at a place where I can play first. Right. And that that's the most important, like lacrosse is what I think about 24 seven. So I know that I was not going to be happy if 
I was, you know, sitting in the player pool for the PLL. Obviously, that was my first goal. Like, talking to my family, I was like, well, goal number one is playing the PLL because that's where the best players are playing. I know. I think I'm one of the best players, so I want to play in that league. But all the best players are playing in the PLL, yeah. so how many, and I play attack, obviously, so how many spots are there going to be open for me to, you know, step in and actually play? Because I'm not going to be pumped if I'm watching this league that I'm, a part of but not really because I've never stepped on the field so do I want to maybe you know like settle basically and play for the MLL yeah and eventually you know I was just talking to I forget who I was talking to probably my dad or my brother because that's who I have you know most of these conversations with um and I was just like I, like I'm gonna bet on myself like I know how good I am I know what I can do I'm I'm just gonna you know sign a, I, I forget what it was like a player pool agreement with the PLL, you know, someone hopefully will take a chance on me and pick me up. And then if I get a chance to play, I know that I'm not going to look back. Yeah. Did you feel like it was coincidental or strategic that, I mean, take your talent out, which, which everyone knows. And, and then, you know, for those that didn't found out uh, as how it would translate to the pro game, but getting acquired by that Redwoods team that has your kind of your lineage, your blood tie to it with Notre Dame, did you feel like that was a part of Nat's decision? Did he? What were those conversations like? And yeah. then I bet you were pumped. I was. I was definitely. I know pumped. you would have been more stoked <laughs> to be with Atlas, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I was definitely <laughs> pumped. I remember. I remember those conversations. So I. I was talking to. You know, I talked to the Notre Dame guys, obviously, um, and I was like, you know, put in a good word, basically. Right. Um, and then I talked to Nat. I was at. I, I remember it very vividly. I was at my buddy's house in uh, New Jersey. We had, so we had you know lost the previous weekend. We left school. We drove to to his beach house. We're hanging out on the beach. Um, and I was talking to Nat, and he was like, "Yeah, um, we're hoping this works out." Um, you know, there's. I think he said that there was one guy ahead of him in the waiver wire or something, um, but that the Notre Dame guys had put in a good word, and you know he had seen me play, and that he liked what he saw. So. If it if it all worked out, I was gonna be part of the team, um, and so I I mean I was relieved, excited, um, anxious, um, yeah. So I think that a little bit of a chance just because you know it worked out that he had the opportunity to pick me up, but then um, the guys that like you said the Notre Dame guys that I played with before probably put in a good word, and he liked the way that they play, and they probably relayed the message to him that I had similar qualities to them, so. Um, yeah, I pulled the trigger. Yeah, I remember it was, I think, if I if I remember correctly, it was the first week of the season because the waiver wires take a full week to clear. And uh, he had acquired you, but we hadn't gotten all the paperwork in such that you could have played in week one, and the rosters for week one were already submitted. Right. So you have all this, like, nuance rule in, in running a sports league and team-by-team -team competition and integrity and so on. So we couldn't turn on the green light for Gillette because I remember practicing in that dome that was adjacent. Were you, were you there for your practice? Yeah. Yeah. So this was Gillette. So this was week one and the woods were walking off and we were walking on to our practice after you guys. And Nat like whispered something in my ear and was like, you better fucking turn on Garnsey for next week. And I was like, what'd you say to me? <laughs> <laughs> but he, he didn't say it like that, but he was basically like, you had an unbelievable practice was the net of it. And, uh, and that you were going to have a role on that team. And then I started thinking, yeah, I wish I grabbed them. <laughs> but uh, but you had that practice, and then you know, played in nine games this season. Had a bunch of stats that uh, I could reel off, or or just say that I, I think from the All Star game and on, I think you led the league in points on a per game basis. And then you popped off in the most meaningful games, which is always a, a sign of a talented and clutch player. So the game that put you guys into the playoffs over Chrome. You had four and three, and then the playoffs, you had 10 points uh, over three games and some big goals. So let me like shift to your, to your mindset during games. Obviously, as an attackman, the change of the rules, there's not as much game time, which means fewer opportunities to score, and that's why guys don't have 70, 80 points in a season, although we, we, it might get there. I think teams are going to get smarter around how to play this game better. Mm -hmm. But shorter field... Shorter quarters, uh, you know, two point arc is inside of a yard, so the game's kind of uh, morphed a little bit. But uh, and I say that to illustrate that your point totals are are more meaningful than potentially what hits the ear. But how do you think about like, how do you approach games? How do you put yourself in a position to score? Like, what's your what's your playing mindset like? 
Um, I think early in the season it was, you know, I had I had a little bit more of a limited role just because we have, I mean, we we touched on this a little bit. But they were rotating you in early. Yeah. 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 So I think for the first, what was San Jose week eight? Yeah. So something like that. From week two, no, not week two. Week two, I didn't really play at all. Week three to week eight, I would play the second and fourth quarter and not on man up. That's hard as an attackman. Yeah, so it's hard to get into <laughs> a little bit of a rhythm. Yeah. Um, week eight comes around. Cav got hurt in the first quarter. So that was still the plan even even in week eight was I was going to play um, the first and third quarter, I think, because I forget who was playing that game. But anyways, Cav gets hurt in the first quarter end up playing the whole game, and that's when my role started to change a little bit. Um, I, I was playing man up after that. Um, so it went from how can I plug these you know, perceived holes that we might have in our lineup? What can I do to make, my, make the lives of you know, all these guys easier to my role started to increase a little bit. I started to look for my shots a little bit more, started to make a little bit of plays on my own a little bit more, maybe dodge a little bit more so I can get other guys involved. Um, so early in the year, it was, I was a little bit more passive, which I don't think that I play well when I am doing that. I like, um, having a little, uh, you know, a certain amount of responsibility. And that's so tricky that we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, but I, I want to press pause because I, I just want to learn from you on this because the, there it's, it's so consistent. I've heard this at all levels. Uh, coaches say, let the game come to you. And I think the natural position to take as an athlete in, in any sport is to be, a little bit more passive. Letting the game come to you feels a bit like a stalemate. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the fucking game passes you by and you haven't had an impact and then you sit and mull and regret for an entire week into the next game and in the first quarter you get shot out of a rocket. You score a couple of goals in the first quarter. So you know, what do you think about that? Like the game coming to you? I suspect it's a little bit different as a tackman too because the game quite literally does yeah. come from one end to the other. Right. But you had talked about it being passive, being passive and then shifting into more of an aggressor. Yeah, I think that there's definitely a balance that you have to find because if you are, you know, forcing the issue too much, and this is something that I found myself doing in college, um, and I thought that I did a pretty good job with it this year of not pressing the issue too much because then you start to turn the ball over and then yeah. you're you're quite frankly being a bad teammate. If you're the guy the ball comes down to, like you said, the attackman um, the, quite literally, the game comes to you. So if you're the first guy that receives it from a D-mid or what, from the goalie, if, uh, if it's a long clear or something, and then you turn the ball over, you're the only guy on offense that touches it, and then nobody else has a say in what's going on. So I think there's definitely a balance between letting the game come to you and trying to assert yourself and picking your spots. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just like where you are in the game, what the score is, how much time is on the shot clock, little things like that that you have to take into consideration when you t uh, are thinking about picking your spots to assert yourself and going to the rack or, um, you know, maybe the midfield line, you're with the twos that run and they haven't had many runs that game and you, you know that it's important that they get into a little bit of a rhythm so you don't, you know, pick the ball up off the end line and go to the rack. You you swing it around the outside and you let one of those guys take a dodge. So I think that uh, having a sense of the game is really important in that aspect. Yeah, so you're more like a quarterback. You have an overall feel and then you're in your ID and personnel. Yeah. And that differs from being a midfielder because your your runs are more defined. And so they, they, they work in tandem. I, anyway, I, I like having this conversation because it's not discussed very often is like the individual and a broader six person offensive set when the game's so fluid. Because you may not, you know, a whole quarter may go by too with shortened quarters and you probably have two or three possessions. And then if you have two midfield lines running, and one of them's only getting on once that quarter. Yeah. So you see that. Oh, this is a second line coming on. Yeah. And you get them the ball. Yeah, for sure. And I think that my relationship with our coaching staff was really important for um, sort of developing that and I don't want to call myself the quarterback because I feel like Cav and Jules and we had so many guys that are smart lacrosse players and know what's going on so it's not just like me you know controlling everything but the relationship from our coaching staff to the guys that are making the decisions on the field is really important because they have enough trust and confidence in us to say we know that you guys know what you're doing we trust your lacrosse IQ so make sure that we don't have to micromanage everything basically. And I think that that leads to a great 
offense. Okay, quick break in the action with Ryder. This episode is being supported by shop.premierlacrosseleague.com, our official PLL merchandise store. Do you want to be a part of the fastest growing sports league in the world? Then grab your merch and support the movement. The PLL shop has everything from jerseys, t-shirts, our Vineyard Vines collection, team socks, hats, and much more. All right, now here's the real. After we launched the Water Dogs a few weeks ago, they quickly became the fastest growing and most sold item in our merchandise store. So for that, I want to encourage everyone to grab their WD merch on shop.premierlacrossleague.com. Also grab Redwoods and Atlas merch for your boy and our guest, Mr. Ryder Garnsey. Back to the show. So you got a, you've got a ton of skill. I want to shift to, to how you develop it. So we were talking before we hit record. You played hockey, but you played uh, goalie. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you excelled in other hand-eye coordination sports, but you've been playing lacrosse for a while. What is your kind of go-to practice style? What are your routines? How do you develop the, you know, the, the soft skills that you have from your catching ability, your finishing ability, creativity? Um, so from when I was, let's see, I was probably five. My dad built this massive wall in our backyard with a Mm -hmm. lacrosse goal painted on. And then the two corners, the top left and right cut out and a net behind it that would catch the balls if I, if I got in the top corner. So from, you know, 10 in the morning till I got tired, basically every summer day when I didn't have to go to school, I was out back shooting on that wall. If you didn't make it in the corner, the ball rolls back to you. So that's you know, where I spent all of my time yeah. developing my skills. I can, you know, vividly remember when I was younger, I wanted to go to Syracuse. I can vividly remember running down, shooting it righty, missing the wall entirely and just being like, wow, if I keep doing that, I'm never going to Syracuse. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's why you're a lefty? So that's why, so that's yeah. why I'm a lefty. I'm, I was like, all right, I just won't put it in my right hand, and then I'll figure it out, then I'll get recruited. So I assume you watched uh, Mikey Powell growing up. Is your, yeah. your kind of your inspiration and style there? At least I could see that Yeah, connection. I mean, I'm definitely not nearly the athlete that Mikey Powell is slash was, um, so I definitely can't do some of, the, some of the things that he did on the field, but I, um, I've i definitely watched his YouTube videos, you know, thousands, thousands of times. times. Yeah, Honestly, yeah, 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 me thousands too. Thousands of and times. And what about your eye block? So he had like the uh, kind of like the upside down triangle and you have one eye black. What's the story behind that? Yeah, you know, I just, I did it my PG year. Um, I just thought it was like cool, trendy. I probably saw someone do it on like a football game or yeah, something yeah. and was like, all right, I'm going to do that. I think that looks pretty badass. Yeah. And then... Um, when I got to Notre Dame, so people always ask me about the eye black and they asked me about the top string on my stick and they both came, uh, the start of both of them, my PG year, both of them really don't have a, like a, you know, a cool background story. It's just like, I thought, I think that looks cool. I'm going to do it. It worked for me. So I'm going to continue doing, doing it. it. Yeah. But then when I got to Notre Dame, I was conscious of like, I don't want to be the freshman like who thinks he's like a big deal with this funky eye black and the funky stick. So I'm going to do everything like very, uh, not everything. Because, Conservative. So you yeah. killed it your freshman year. Yeah. You weren't doing one eye black and no. and funky I didn't, top string. And I didn't want to give, you know, anyone else a reason to, th- you know, a reason to think that I thought I was yeah. all that. It's good awareness, chance. man. Yeah. So yeah. killed it. Um, I brought, and then for some reason I let someone else string my stick sophomore year, which I still regret, and that was stupid. So I didn't have it's the top. String underrated, that. man, having a, a well strung stick. Oh, I hate not stringing my own stick. And then oh, so you string your own? I string my own. Okay. So I get and you I, to string. That was one. the only year since I learned how to string my stick in like you know fourth or fifth grade that I haven't stringed my stick, and it was fine. Like it, I like I don't blame you know the shots that I missed on the stick, but I. I regret not stringing my own stick that year. And then junior year brought back the top string. I don't know if, I can't remember if I wore the one eye black junior year or not. Um, junior year was the, the goal you scored in overtime and you did like the dead fish celebration? That was sophomore year. Sophomore year? Who sophomore was that year. against? Virginia. Virginia. At Virginia. At Virginia. Um, <laughs> had yeah. that, had you played that out in your head before? Well, what was the, what was the story there? Was so I played and I still play FIFA all the time. Uh, uh, I yeah, love yeah. playing FIFA. And one of my buddies who was a senior on the team, Ben Pridemore then, uh, I went up to him before overtime and I was just like, you're going to want to watch this if I get the ball. And he oh, was, you said it before you scored? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, what are you talking about? I was like, cause, and we would play FIFA against each other. So I was like, right, you know how I do the dead fish every time I score? And he's like, oh, God. Yeah. And then I scored. And then. So was this the huddle going into overtime? Yeah. So coaches, 
uh, doing his, you know, adjustments. I'm at like the outskirts listening to coach. And right before I walk back onto the field, I look at pride. And I'm like, watch this. Come on. Yeah. Do you do that at every overtime game? Are you, are you that I like, did calm it. and poised to be like, all right, let me start thinking about my celebration. Cause I think about that shit before the game, like, in a what if this would be awesome situation. I play a lot of FIFA too. So I'll vibe with you on this. But once overtime comes, I'm all tight and I'm like, I just need to, I just need to fucking get it done. However it happens. No, you know, I was, so you're mapping this out, walking yeah. out. So my, your my PG year, we played in overtime six times. We were six and zero in overtime. Um, and every, this is like, a, I'm just like bragging. No, beat your chest, man. Every time what the Redwoods do, right? I touched the ball three times that year in overtime. <laughs> I scored three goals in overtime. I did the stanky leg in overtime every single time. And every time I went up to my buddies, and I was like, what well, again? If I if I touch the ball, stanky legs coming. Yeah. So, and that was, I didn't do that my freshman year at Notre Dame. We played one overtime game that year. But like I said, I was sort of just like, I'm not going to you know, yeah. piss anyone off. And Cavs scored, you know, obviously. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, sophomore year, I think that was the only overtime game we played that year. And I went up to prime where I was like, yeah, watch this. Soccer celebrations are the best because yeah. they're so elongated. They're I given know. that time because they score so few amount of times during yeah. games. Yeah, so so people are always <laughs> like, oh, bring back the celebrations. I'm like, well, if I score an overtime goal, okay. Yeah. But if I score a goal to go up three to two in the first quarter, <laughs> no. It'd be kind of tight if you started that trend. I don't know. I don't know. I go for it, man. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so so you so you get asked about the eye buck, you get asked about the top string. Do you get asked about it'd be it'd be a it'd be a really uh insider question which i will ask for those who came to the all-star game and stuck around for the skills competition so you brought a basketball net like this portable backboard and uh didn't get into the second round so we never saw what you were gonna do yeah yeah so what i was gonna do you don't have to say but you kind of have to say yeah i'll say um (laughs) so if if it worked out you know because i I honestly hadn't even tried it out because i got the basketball uh hoop earlier that morning so i didn't have time to like practice all this stuff it was just like what yeah what can i i was thinking about it on my way out here um you know texting some of my buddies you guys got any good good ideas you know every stick trick and you know stall on the rail of your sidewall has been done before i need to do something outside of the box and i i don't remember probably my dad my dad's super creative so i think he gave me this idea the plan was cav and apple were going to hold the backboard um they were going to be in front of the goal the backboard facing the end line and i was going to run from the end line throw the ball off the backboard like an alley-oop to myself, catch it, and then dunk on the goalie. Oh, Um, I see. So you weren't going to put it through the hoop. You were just going to use it as like a set design. Yeah, to use it as the backboard, bounce it back to myself, and then dunk. Um, So, yeah, like you said, I didn't make it to the finals, but that was the the idea behind it. All right, so most of the stuff you're describing is like very fluid in the moment. Do you have any... uh, like pregame superstitions, do you have any routines at all? You know, I don't, I'm not the most disciplined person in the world. So <laughs> when, like, uh, if I try to, if I tried to, you know, tape my stick the same way pregame every time, something would happen where I forgot my tape or, and, I, and I'm very peculiar about things. So I don't want to use someone else's tape that I don't like as much. I would rather use the tape that I had for three weeks prior that's still on my stick that I know does the job. So I try to avoid things like that because if I had them and I forgot to do something about it, I feel like I would psych myself out. So I don't, I don't really have anything that I have to do pregame. I have the same, you know, playlist that I'll listen to just because that's on my phone. My phone's always going to be on me. So like, I I don't have to worry about not having that available to me. What's on the playlist? Um, I'm not, I'm not that hip. So it's like pretty old at this point Shit that works i know i listen to a lot of stuff that i when i was really grinding probably in high school and early college that's when we were putting in long hours of work right it's like any pro athlete can relate to that because it just life just changes yeah and and when you you get those songs they bring you put it on to this day and i'm like i remember when i was a sophomore in that weight room or on that field like Listening to System of a Down. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to agree with me on that, but I rocked the System of a Down, Nine Inch Nails, all the 90s stuff, because that's when I was grinding, 90s, mm-hmm. 90s, early 2000s. So yeah, it, it brings me back, and it's 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 kind of cool, honestly, to to have these songs that 
don't really, I don't, you know, I don't know these artists or whatever, but they yeah. mean something to me because of the places that I've gone with them. Yeah. We'll post your playlist on the show notes. All right. we'll, we'll screen grab that. Do you have a Spotify account? I got a Spotify account. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. So what about other guys in, in the locker room? Anyone have like a, who are like the best room guys? Um, well, Greg brings the speaker. So that's probably the most important guy. Greg Beast? Greg Beast yeah. brings the speaker. So he's probably the most important. Um, and then DJ fluctuates a little bit. So I wouldn't say that there's one guy that I'm like, yeah, he kills it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't really have a great Who gives answer the best pregame that. talks? Um, we've got a bunch of guys in our room that can get the, get the guys going. Um, and, you know, Kyle, if Kyle talks, everyone's listening. So that's an easy answer. Um, I guess someone that's a little bit more under the radar, Jack Near. Yeah. Um, I was watching the uh, mic'd up, the season long mic'd up, um, and there was, uh, you know, five or ten seconds from him from the championship game that I I remember and I I had forgot about, and then I was like, oh yeah, shit, that got me going. And yeah. then I was thinking about the other times that he did that, and the same thing in the semifinals when we were in New York. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll go, I'll go with Jack Near. Yeah, there are guys like that that when they they speak, they command a room. Yeah. And they're intense. They can also provide some levity. What's up with this uh, this thing called flagging? Epo said he invented it. No. It's supposed to go back to you. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. some guys interviewed a few of your buds. No, so honestly, it came from, I give my, my buddy Jack Barry, who is a, uh, <laughs> one of my buddies from Notre Dame. Um, he introduced it to me, and I introduced it to Apple, and then it sort of spread throughout okay. our locker room this summer. So what is it? It's just like... Uh, like it's not lying because it's it's like if you're like boasting about yourself but everyone's like that's not true you're flagging. oh it's flagging yeah. we called it booching well, at hopkins you probably hear harry say that don't I, booch me like, don't booch me i don't know if i've heard him never say heard that. him say that i don't think so yeah, yeah so you guys call it flagging yeah so if like if someone's talking smack and you're like nah you're flagging yeah, yeah <laughs> and then uh and then aren't we lucky you have tattoos yeah yeah, so me. This is a family one. Yeah, this is a family one. I have two tattoos, one on my back and one on my thigh. Um, they're both family things. Um, the one on my thigh looks a little bit funky, so whenever someone's like, "What is that?" I don't really want to explain it every time to somebody. So I'm just like, "Oh yeah, I just like decide to get this tattoo," and they're like, "You're an idiot." I'm like, "Oh whatever." Yeah. Um, so the it's one like, on my back. It's like having a lobster on your abs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, just don't even go there. So the one on my back, um, <laughs> me and my brother and sister all have it in the same place, and it's just um, something my mom's dad used to say all the time, just, aren't we lucky? Just, like, we've got it pretty good, basically. You know, yeah. whenever, even, you know, when, like this spring, and the cross wasn't taken from me. I didn't do what I needed to do to play. So I don't, I'm not, it's not like a pity party. I don't want anybody's sympathy, but. It was tough, right? You know, yeah. I love lacrosse. I wanted to play, you know, and it sucked watching, you know, my teammates play without me. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, and I would talk to my parents all the time just because, you know, that's what I felt like I would do. Those were like my therapists or whatever. At the end of the day, I still had it pretty good. I still was going to an unbelievable school. I had an unbelievable support system in my family. I have awesome friends. Um, I'm going to graduate from Notre Dame. I still, at that point, had played three years of pretty high level lacrosse. Um, my lacrosse career wasn't over. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen moving forward, but there was still a small light at the end of the tunnel. So that was just like the way that I sort of tried to and try to live my life. Like things might suck right now, but we've got it pretty good regardless. And how do you think about building off of that? How do you think about the next stage, your professional career? I mean, let's, let's, we've talked about coaching, but your role with the Redwoods and how you view yourself in the PLL and it's like team USA. Are you trying to make a run at that? Yeah, for sure. What's I mean, the next decade for you? Like, I don't have the answers. Um, like hopefully team USA, you know, I think that if you're a lacrosse player or any athlete, that's sort of, you know, the ultimate goal playing for your country. Um, so yeah, definitely. Hopefully that hopefully, you know, 10 championships with the Redwoods. Yeah. Um, but I think that to sort of bring the two, to tie the two together, I think that we've got a pretty good culture in our room and that when things go bad, we understand that 
first of all, they could be worse. So don't let it get worse. And second of all, we've got what we need in this room to make it get better. So let's just put one foot in front of the other and, and doing that rather than sulk and let things get worse. Nice. Cool. Um, but yeah, the next decade, I'm really excited for it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, obviously, I don't want to be like, you know, tooting your own horn as much, but you guys have given us a pretty good platform here to build off of. So I think it's up to us to make sure that we do what we need to do to make sure that it uh, grows the way that I can. And you've got your first training camp you'll play in. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm very excited for that. Honestly, because I'm a lacrosse fan, you know, so like I was, we, we had our game against Duke. Um, that weekend. So I remember talking to Cav. He's like, yeah, I can't actually watch the game because we got training camp. I got practice. But um, so I remember just like trying to soak in all the media that you guys are putting out there on Instagram and everything. I was like, wow, this looks fucking awesome. Yeah. Like I want to be a part of that. I mean, obviously I had first and foremost was Duke and I wasn't by no means was I like, yeah, you don't need this and I want to play PLL. But but at you the were. same time, I was like, "Yeah, that's, you were like, I gotta start cool. playing PLL." Yeah, yeah. eventually, <laughs> eventually, give me, give me two weeks. I'll start in June. Yeah, two but weeks yeah. and a trip to the beach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited for training camp. I'm excited for you know week one, wherever that is. I'm excited for getting back in the room with all the guys. Um, you doing anything for your diet and working out and stuff like that? Um, I I don't eat well at all. You should change I, that. I should change yeah, that. Yeah, man. Um, Come on. I. I you, you ask anybody that knows me, and they'll people tell me. think diet is, is binary. You're either like eating clean as hell and focused on it daily, or you're not, and uh, it's just not the case. Right. You need to be in the middle, though. Ideally, like towards the yeah, like three quarters upper towards, end of, yeah. of focus and good nutrition, because you're just going to play longer and you're going to survive injury, and you're going to probably avoid injury too. Yeah, that that's the biggest thing. So my sophomore year, I ate really well. For myself, because and then you had someone string you a shitty stick, and I had someone. Well, so back. The problem was I broke my pelvis in training camp for Notre Dame that year, and mm. tore my groin. So then I Ugh. was really, really hypersensitive about the things. Like I, I didn't go out as, as much if ever because, I couldn't do the conditioning that we were doing in practice because it was so much like, and the like the buzzword in the NBA is load management. Right. So it's, I'd, it was sort of like that because rather than do, you know, the two sprints or whatever we would do um, for punishment, I, I was told by the trainers, don't do that. Do 10 sit-ups or something because you're only, it's just like a, a time bomb, basically. Like you can't, it's not going to heal itself. So right. you're just preventing further injury the whole time. So I, I, I didn't go out because I knew I wasn't doing as much conditioning. So I would basically just gotten super fat. Um, I tried to eat a little bit better and I still didn't eat that great, but yeah, yeah, that's when it was. And then when I got healthy again, I was like, Oh now I can eat like, you know, chicken wings or whatever. Yeah. So with your your workouts, you lift, run and shoot or right now do you just play more lacrosse and you work out, work out being Um, lifting and running? I, I would say I, I run more than I lift Yeah. and I play lacrosse more than both of those. Just be. Like I said, I'm not the most disciplined person in the world, and I love playing the cross. So I could be out there on the field for three hours, and it goes by like that. And running is – I'm I'm sort of indifferent about it. I, I'll get it over with. I don't like spending time in the weight room, as you can probably tell. No, I can't. But well, m- most people can tell. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last question, when you're out on the field for three hours, do you uh, count your reps? Do you put together a program, or you just play? I just play. Yeah. Yeah. You don't I, try to shoot like 50 on you. You're not obsessive. And I'm OCD not obsessive like as far as like the number. I know that I, I, and I don't have like a specific time limit, but I'll probably get, you know, 30 reps coming from X to my left, coming to my right. Or I'm just like, wow, that was a f- awesome 15 minutes doing that. I'll move on to something else. Yeah. And then I'll shoot down the alley lefty and righty. And if I, I'm sucking shooting down the alley lefty. I'll spend, you know, a half hour rather than 10 minutes or f- vice versa. Got it. Good so shit. it's very much like how I'm, how I'm doing that day. Um, and it's not like I'm going to spend, you know, f- I'm going to do 50 of each and then move on to the next one. It's very much how I'm feeling about where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, and man. that's sort of the way that I like live 
my life across the board. Just like if I think something needs attention, I'll deal with it. But I don't like set out every week with goals. And I think that's sort of something that I want to change because I, I find myself drifting a little bit too much. Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you can set goals and continue to operate on energy levels versus time. You know, a lot of people will manage their calendar based on time. And then some of the most effective people manage their calendar based on just their energy. Yeah. And I, I think I am very like in the 90th percentile as far as off of my energy. Yeah. But I think that I need a little bit more structure than I put in place for myself. So I'm excited to get back into a little bit more structured environment in the spring with Notre Dame, going to class for, and I, I don't have my exact schedule yet, but in my head, my ideal world is go to class from like 10 to 11.30, go watch some film or do something in the office with coach and the coaching staff, get the guys ready. You have way. access to all those resources too. Yeah, so that's, huge perk that, yeah, back. exactly. Um, and then I'll have access to the workouts and stuff that those guys are doing. And then all the goalies are going to need shots at some point. I, I made sure that I talked to all of them and was like, listen, if you ever, and I, I sent a message to the whole team. I was like, if you guys ever need anything as far as someone to pass to, someone to um, get passes from, goalies, if you guys need someone to get shots from, defenders, if you ever need someone to do one-on-ones, like I'm going to have a lot more time than you guys are. So please, please reach out to me and we'll set something up because I, it, first of all, I want to help you guys. Second of all, I, I want to get better too. So let, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, brother. Well, thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having yeah. me. Awesome stories. I want to give one more shout out to Ryder Garnsey, our first ever guest. If you enjoyed this first episode of Unbuckle Chinstrap, please subscribe. Give us a five-star rating and review. This episode and future episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your pods. So tune in there. And before I forget, our upcoming show, The Inside Feed with Emma Adams and Lisa Redman, is beginning very soon. And next week on Unbuckle Chinstrap, lacrosse legend, PLL builder, Redwoods midfielder, Kyle Harrison, is joining me for a live edition of the show from the Philadelphia U.S. Lacrosse Convention. See you all then. Mm.